Oh, good morning. Well, thank you, Aaron, for uh, leading the singing. You know, otherwise you would have had a double header of me, which is nothing to look forward to. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, between Aaron and Amanda, we certainly are blessed by the those that would play the piano for us. Otherwise, well. I'm sure the Lord appreciates our singing, but sometimes we don't appreciate each other's singing, right? Um, and that's a shot at me, nobody else, by the way. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 31. And I have the pleasure of having the last chapter in 1 Samuel. You know, when you're the Sunday school superintendent, you, gotta, you kind of get the opportunity to pick your own fate. So... I get to start it, and I get to stop it. I, but that, anyway, yeah, no, I don't. That's just a joke. But anyway, you know, when, when I was preparing for this, I, before I get started and open in prayer, I just, the world, and when I mean the world, the life, what's around us sometimes makes us think that none of it matters. Like we don't matter. Like, like, okay, the hopelessness that is rampant in our society. I served in an air data of 15 people, 15 men and women. Four of them are dead now. One overseas, three by their own hand. These are people that I went places with that were smart, intelligent, funny. I mean, one of the guys, Ryan Gernot, he, we, it would be pouring down rain in Okinawa, and he would make you laugh so hard you almost pee your pants, okay? It was just, he was an amazing guy. And he's gone now. Why is that? Because it's hopelessness. And that's what Satan wants you to feel. Whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, or what, and I, that, even that, that's a, that's a hard battle. When you know you've been saved by grace and you have that relationship with Jesus, you can, Satan could still hammer you, make you feel completely useless. I feel really bad for those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior because, boy, it's an uphill battle. I mean, there is no hope. And I got talking, I'm not going to pick on you, Joe, all right? But I got talking to Joe and, uh, and Caleb, and they, they're, they're guys that work with their hands. And any guy that can work, or woman, that works with their hands, they look at it as something simple like a chair here. And they see that chair, and it's a, it's a simple thing. But try to just make it happen with your words. Chair, come together. Okay, now stop. God spoke creation into existence. You are not an accident. Each one of us, and those that will hear this message, know that you are a human being that God knows and loves and wants to be in relationship with you. So if you don't hear anything else I talk about today, that's okay. I want you to hear that. You are loved. You are here for a purpose that is divine. And whether you want to take that purpose and run with it is up to you. See, people think hell is for this awful place that God created for, I don't know, people that have sin. Okay? Hell is for those that want to be separated from Christ, separated from God. Okay? If you want an eternity without God, you're going there already. If you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is your eternal destination. And it's not because of anything good or bad you did. It's just because you're human. And Andy Palmer goes to heaven, I'm going to heaven because I can rest on the assurance of his word. It's not because of anything good I did. And nothing in me exists that warrants me being with God forever. Nothing. So take this this morning. You are loved. God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for you. And you can have that right now. You can in, just totally envelop yourself with that love, that forgiveness, that hope, that peace that we heard about this morning that passes all understanding. You can have it. It's your choice. 
1 Samuel chapter 31. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the reading of your word, Lord, and just help us to bring honor and glory to the Savior. In his name we pray, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilbo. Gilbo, excuse me. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, Malshish, Uah. I, I probably butchered that. Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men, the enemies of God, come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his own sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilbo. And they, all, and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temples of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Esdras, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bashan. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilba, Gilbed heard that the Philistines had done, what had the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled at night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son sons, excuse me, from the wall of Bashan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So ends the first book of Samuel. So, that is not a happy ending, is it? No. And I just wanted to kind of recap Saul's journey. But first, beforehand, we all got to just rest and have comfort in the fact that the Bible's about real people. I take comfort in that. I hope you do. Okay? It's not a fairy tale of a bunch of men and women who just were perfect. It is real life. That life you're experiencing now in some way, and shape, and form is back. Right? Though it's a saying, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, so the people we're reading about in this book, this great, this awesome book we've been blessed with, in our own language that we can read whenever we want, it's a real book. It's a real, it's stories of real people who had, I don't know, disobeyed and obeyed God. All in the same lifetime. Sound familiar? Right? Okay. And how about the, the, the storylines of tragedy and triumph? But we're just going through in 1 Samuel. And then the hope that people have, and then the despair that we just read, right? The, they emptied the cities. That's like us and Blaisdell seeing the Canadians conquer Buffalo, and we're out of here, okay? That, that's what it happened. It's real life. They forsook the cities. It's a book of real human interactions. It's not fairy tales. And it has real human characters. One of the best things I ever had, one of the best things I've ever been blessed to have the opportunity to do is to go to Israel and see. I mean, the, the, I can't even describe it. The books of the Bible come alive. The pages, they come alive when you get to see where Abraham was. You get, when you got to see where Elijah on the mount, where he, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the priest of Baal, right? And all that interaction of it. And then this, where you saw, I, I was in the valley where David killed Goliath. Something I was taught from a little kid of what happened. I could look and see that this is a real place. This isn't a fantasy book. 
about the seventh moon to the fifth star, okay? Not that pick anybody that likes to read that stuff. I'm just saying, this is real. What saw? What a journey from hero to zero. That could be all of us, though, right? The key is, do you stay a zero? And that would be one thing I want to kind of hit on a little bit, but how could someone who started out so promising, right? He was the chosen king of Israel, anointed by Samuel. We, we all like to just brush over that fact that he was anointed. But no, he was anointed. If you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10, well, don't, I'll just read it real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And there is, there is uh, trouble in the land of Israel. Uh, uh, then it actually says where Saul, the spirit, okay, verse 6 of chapter 11, then the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news. And he was, his anger was greatly aroused about some injustices that happened to the people of Israel. The spirit of God came on Saul. Again, we like to brush over that sometimes. So he started out so well. And how could that same person that started out so well and so promising, the first king of Israel, end up on the side of a mountain, surrounded by his enemies, and killing himself, begging to die so he doesn't get tortured? And it would be different if he was on that mountainside. He was getting ready to die, and he had, he's dying and doing his duty, Right? Like I, I deployed in several areas where we always, in the back of our mind, kept an extra round in the chamber, if you know what I mean. Because life happens. And so, what, I won't get into, anyway, sorry, sidetrack, won't do that. Okay. What I'm trying to say is what really is heart-rendering in Saul's case is that he died by his own hand outside the will of God, right? I'm not going to go into whether it's your God's will that you kill yourself or not. That's a, that's a whole deep discussion. What I'm trying to say is that he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. And he was in a place where he shouldn't have been. And he killed himself. And he washed his son. Well, I don't know if he washed, doesn't say it, but his sons died around him. Could you imagine that? The heartbreak? And don't, isn't that like humanity? We always bring that on ourselves. Right? It's a horrible thought, but... So could Saul have repented? Could Saul have said, okay, David, it's obvious you are God's anointed king. I support you. Is that what happened? No. But let's take it into today's day and age for each of us. Okay? Acts 20. Those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, it is so, as Savior, excuse me, it is so, so important you start out great, and that's awesome, and it's so wonderful to come in the fullness of the salvation and understand what that means and the rest we can have. But read Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24. Make sure I have it right, first of all. <laughs> uh, yep, here we go. And uh, see... This is Paul, right? And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. How are we going to finish the race? 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. Verses 6 to 7. Those of you who think the Christian life is supposed to be easy and prosperity gospel certainly need to study the, the life of Christ, number one, and then the life of uh, Paul. Verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. 
You ever wake up and just feel completely exhausted? Like you got nothing more to give? I wonder if that's what it's like, right? For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. At the end of it all, when we close our eyes for that last time, if the Lord doesn't come back, when we're done and we know it, are you going to be able to say in your head, I finished the race well? Not in like a way that I finished the race well. It's I didn't deviate from what the Lord Jesus Christ called me to do. Those of us, again, that follow Lord Jesus Christ and count him as our Lord and Savior. And that's so important because if you aren't in that relationship with Jesus Christ, this isn't for you. This, talk, I, I, this avenue I've looked into kind of about it's running the good race. Look, you're running into, in futility right now if you try to be a good person without Jesus Christ. It's nice to be nice, sure. But without Christ, it, it, what does it benefit? Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Aren't we blessed to know that finishing the race well isn't simply by our will? <laughs> I'm going to say that again. I heard you try amen to that. But aren't we blessed to know that finishing the race well as Christians isn't simply based off our will. Rather, it's the work of Christ in us and through us. That's the linchpin. That's everything. Because, like, let's read the Bible. It doesn't matter what I say. Philippians 1, verses 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine, make a request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. This is Paul talking to the church in Philippi, okay? Verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it. We have that promise. He will complete it. You know what stops the full fruition of that accomplishment is us. Us getting distracted. Us falling away. Us caring more about uh, my business. Us caring more about my family. Us caring, and those are all okay and good things. Actually, family is very important. I'm spitting up here. What I'm trying, it's Christ. It needs to be Christ. Period. I'm not even past my first page of notes. All right. So, isn't our purpose in life now as believers to serve Jesus, right? And that means to serve Jesus wherever he leads us. And that's a scary thing for those of us that are control freaks. I want to go where I want to go. But if I'm humble before the Lord and I'm here, I'm all, bought, I'm all in to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, he may take me where I don't want to go. How about this? To honor him in everything we do. It doesn't say just honor him by coming to church on Sunday. It doesn't just say honor him in our, our, uh, our devotions because those are all good things, right? It says, uh, I think we should honor, the Bible teaches we should honor Christ in all things. And that's an attitude. To worship him in spirit and truth. I heard this great little... YouTube clip, and I just got to share it. It was this preacher, and he was saying, you know, we come here and we sing, and we consider that worship, and it is a form of worship. But true worship is when you're in your bedroom all alone or wherever on your phone, and you can look at a picture you know you shouldn't, and you're struggling. The Holy Spirit is inside. You go, don't do it, Andy. Don't do it. But you want to. Your flesh is like, I want to see that. I want that. And then you don't look. That's worship. That is worshiping the Most High God who has put the Holy Spirit in you to defeat your flesh. 
and doing in that, when you're there in that situation, it's just, and from what I can understand of Scripture, it is a precious thing to the Lord. Because he knows that you're not in front of a bunch of people doing something for them. You're doing it for him. You know, the wonderful and liberating thing about being a follower of Christ, it isn't about me doing this or that. It's about how he saved me. How his work on the cross per forever provided a way of salvation to a sinful and deceitful people, and that's us, all right? It's all about his will being accomplished in my life, no matter what. Jesus is the whole sum of the matter. Jesus. And your relationship with him. My holiness. And, okay. When I, I, I typed this in, I said I any holiness, but I put my holiness, so I just said it. So any holiness, any that you see, happen to see, glimpses of, not even a little bit of, whatever, of Andy Palmer is because of Jesus Christ. Any sanctification of me throughout the years and you throughout the years of your process and your relationship with Jesus Christ that happens is because of Jesus. My salvation, the very fact that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with my God is because of Jesus. Literally, all good things that can be or should be produced in a Christian's life is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't stress that enough because it is so important. We all rest in the fact that we have a Savior, those of us who believe, but sometimes when in your walk with Christ, you get into this rut of doing things because it needs to be done or doing what you think you should do because other people think you should do it. The sum of the matter needs to be Christ. And that is an easy thing to say, hard thing to practice. And it shouldn't be, right? It literally should be the easiest thing we do. But us humans, we like to screw everything up. So, verses 1 through 6, back in our text in chapter 31, right? When things go from bad to worse. That's what I have this uh, as, like, titled, if you will. There's a saying by Humphrey Bogart says, things are never so bad that they can't be made worse. Right? Who here has experienced that, right? It's like a, it's, it's like a one-two jab, right? I'm not a boxer, but, I you know, it's like one, two, and then you put your head down to duck, and then it's the uppercut. That's life sometimes, right? It's just, man, it's hard sometimes. And, I'm, and that's what's great about uh, so many times in my life, I've seen preachers and people that have come up to here, whatever. I'm not a preacher. I'm just a servant. But if, if you come up here and you, and you portray this perfection, that's the worst thing you can do. The worst, right? They, uh, Jesus was perfection, and he hung out with losers. If we are going to speak the word of God, we need to be like Jesus, and we're, gonna, we're not perfect, so that's an easy, attainable goal, right? But we need to communicate that to people that have come under, the, the, under the, the teaching of Scripture that anything that is good that comes out of this body is because of Jesus, whether it's verbal, an action, a thought, it's because of Jesus. So I beat that to, dead to a horse. So things go bad to worse. Think of Saul right now in our scripture. He knows David's going to be king of Israel. He knows it. He said it, right? 1 Samuel 26, 25. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. Saul knew the end game. Don't ask me how. Like maybe it's because Samuel told him and he had such faith in Samuel or maybe it was the, the sorcerer or whatever. I don't know, you know. 
All you can do is go off of Scripture, and off of Scripture we can say, see plainly that Saul knows that David is going to prevail as king of Israel. And yet Saul won't really relinquish this control, this illusion of control that he has. He is going to power through because I'm Saul. I know what's best. I'm going to control my destiny no matter where it leads, good or bad. Unbeliever, unbeliever, any one of us here or is hearing this message, again, I'll say that. Are you one of those poor souls that thinks you're in control? Are you? And I don't mean to belittle you or anything like that. It's only, I'm only a, a beggar showing another beggar where the food is, okay? Is that I, I think still I have control over things I don't have control over because that's humanity. That is what we want. We want to think we have all the answers. But if you don't know Christ, you think you can control anything? And if you don't think you can control anything, well, that's kind of a horrible place to be because literally anything you do, you have no influence on anything. So when I think of somebody that hasn't come under the control of Christ, I hear of Saul, I think of Saul, and I think of this horrible story of Saul that we went through from first, all in 1 Samuel and David. Obviously, there's other characters, but I think of Saul specifically because this is the end of Saul's life right here. And I think of that struggle, and I think, what else, what, what could have been different? What could have been different? You think of Saul in this beginning of the chapter here, and there's no reliance on God to defeat the Philistines. We don't read of anything that he went to God to seek his face on how to tackle the Philistines. There's no reliance at all on the Lord for direction. It's purely a man-centric way of controlling or tackling an issue. You know, I'm reminded of something of another Saul in, in the New Testament, and it's it, we don't have time to go there, but it's, it's when Saul, right? Saul in the New Testament was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Saul knew the law. He lived the law. He was going to do it what he thought was his way, and he was going to hammer down this, this cult called followers of the way this, that worshiped this guy Jesus that says he's still alive, whatever. But they're against Judaism, and I hate them. I'm going to destroy them. This was Saul of the New Testament. And you know what? Saul was fighting that Christianity, that cult. And he was fighting what he thought was God's battles, wasn't he? But it was a very man-centric way. It was all about what men could do to fight God's battles for him. I'm sorry he's God. He doesn't need your help. We get to help. So it... And we all know a story. I won't, I won't uh, belabor the point, but in the New Testament, Paul, as soon as, you know, I got to go there because I'm going to mess it up. In Acts. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 6. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any of who were of the way, whether man or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Then he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, this is Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to take away two things from just that short passage. When Jesus says it's hard for you to kick against the goads, literally it means God is directing here the, this pathway that's going to happen, and you're trying to kick against God, right? It's like a herder that's uh, trying to wrangle in his animals, and the animal is eventually going to lose. I'm sorry, almost every case, right? There's some frisky ones. I can tell you a story about a calf that got loose on my brother Mark, and we spent an afternoon chasing it. But this, Jesus is saying, stop. 
Just stop, Paul. I know your heart. I'm, I'm adding words where I shouldn't. Stop. And what does Saul do of the New Testament? What does he say? What does he say? Anybody? What do you want me to do? Submission. Bam. Immediately. Now, rewind. I wonder how the scriptures would have been different if Saul submitted to God's will in the Old Testament. Would Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malishia die like they did? They certainly would die, but would they died around their father on a mountainside in defeat? Maybe the Israelites would have been victorious in this battle we're reading about. I don't know. I'm not going to put words that aren't there, okay? It really comes down, though, I want to stress this. What do you choose to do? You, me. Do you put your trust in the world or, worse yet, yourself or the government? Or do you put your trust in Jesus Christ? If you're here today and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, please, please accept him now. You don't have to understand theology. You don't have to understand all this Bible teaches. You don't even have to understand half the stuff I'm talking about. You've got to understand one thing, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine. And all you have to do is ask him to come into your life. I'd say one thing Alistair Begg puts it so beautifully, it's called the man in the middle cross. We like, Christians like to put a bunch of stuff out there. The man on the middle cross told the other thief on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise because of his belief. You don't need to know theology. You don't need to know the 66 books of the Bible. It's good to know. It's great to know. It's great to grow in. But what you need is the Lord Jesus Christ in your life today. The forgiveness, the love, the acceptance, the grace, the mercy, all at the same time is an amazing thing. And I'm begging you to consider it. Don't think, oh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do that someday. Look, you, there's a, if you're in a gym, you don't go to a gym. You don't get in shape first, then go to the gym. You go to the gym to get in shape. You don't become a Christian, but first get cleaned up. You accept that gift of salvation first, and then Jesus Christ cleans you up. Because when we say, I'm going to clean myself up, oh, okay, that's, that's man-centric. That's you doing you. That isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't get cleaned up before a shower. The shower cleans you up. The Lord does the one who does the cleaning. It's not me. It's not this church. It's not your good works. The Lord, period. So, fellow believer, I'm almost out of time. And I've only covered six verses, not even. Believers, do we have problems with control? Do we can want to control everything? And this is, I'm going to kind of go through this, but this is very important. This was helpful for me. I pray it be helpful for, for you. Do we depend on the Lord for direction in our lives when we may not like the answer? Do we seek God's blessings on our plans, saying, I'm going to do this, God. Is that okay? Or do we seek to better understand God's plans for our life? It's a very different outlook. But I, I got to add, it's not a, 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 a pass for Christians to just sit there and, Lord, whatever will you want, I'll do. I'm just going to sit here and wait for your direction. No, because there's very clear directions already given. We have this, I put it already, we have this amazing book. It's called the Bible, and it has so much information if you read it. Okay, and it, it, it points us in, in life. It, look, I put together a very short list from the word of God that Jesus asked in the gospels for us. It doesn't go into the teachings of the epistles or anything like that. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, Luke twenty two nineteen. Let your light shine before men. Matthew five sixteen. Put yourselves last, others first. Mark nine thirty five. 
Guard against every form of greed. Luke 12, 15. Don't judge according to appearance. Woo! June, uh, John 7, 24. Love one another. John 13, 34. Keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. <laughs> Uh-oh. Amen. That is a tough one. It's Luke 6, 27. Have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. And this one, at this time of year, pay your taxes. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that, but literally Jesus got a coin. says, render to Caesars what is Caesar and God's is God's. Pay your taxes. Matthew twenty two twenty one, 21. Abide in me. Not me, him. John 15, 7 to 12. How about this in Mark, excuse me. Mark 13, 33 to 37 says, Take heed and be on alert. You do not know when the appointed time will come. Matthew 6, 31. Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Christian, it's not an exhaustive list. There's a lot more. And it's actually practical things we can do that Christ calls us to do. I always appreciate this little saying, control the controllables, right? There's tons of ways on that list that we can control the controllables. You know what? Can we stop the Ukraine-Russo war? Can we stop it? No, we cannot stop that war. But we can pray for the blood shop bloodshed to stop and we can pray for those and support the missions that are over there to help those people do you see the difference control the controllables I am out of time and I obviously the Lord had a plan but I'm like five pages away from ending so I don't keep you guys here but what I wanted to say in, in closing uh, the last six verses is an awesome story. I really haven't got too much time of valiant men who saw something wrong and they did it, something about it. Now, I will dare say there's valiant men and women. And I can tell you that looking out in the world today and how I grew up and how my kids are growing up, we need valiant men and women to do what is right. It's not a comfortable conversation and it's not easy to do. Rosa Parks, she was a civil rights lady. We, when Rosa Parks sat in the front of the bus and sat in the back, okay? She stood up for what was right. She said this, you must never be fearful about what you are doing when it's right. Don't be afraid. Fear not. That's in the Bible a lot. Fear not. So these gallant men gallant and valiant men of Gilead. Number one, first of all, to be called valiant, right? I don't know about other men, but if somebody, on my, when I'm dead and gone, my kid's going, my, my dad was a valiant man, I'd be like, yes! In scripture, throughout the annals, these, ten, I mean, these valiant men walked 10 miles at night to take the king of Israel down off a wall after his body had been beheaded. Do you think that that wasn't guarded? Do you think it was just on the wall and just sitting there for anybody to mess with it? Maybe it was, maybe it isn't. But in my mind's eye, I have an idea of guys, girls. It says valiant men, so we got to go with Scripture says. It, valiant men got around and said, this isn't right. We're going to do something about it. Let's go. Roll out. Sometimes in life, there is a time. It's like, Lament, I think it's uh, Lamentations, or is it, it's Ecclesiastes, I think. Because, yeah, there's a time to laugh, and there's a time to cry. There's a time to pray. There's a time to act. Sometimes we get, when we know what is right, we got to move. I say that with what we talked about before also, right? We're, we are not doing things under our own will and power. We are before the Lord on every aspect of our life. But when you know, you know. When I was in the Navy, and I'm going to wrap up with this, we always laughed at how glorified our job was. I was a Navy diver, right? And everybody wants to be a Navy diver when you're in the Caribbean and you got a 100 feet vis and the water temperature is 80 degrees. But I'll tell you what, nobody, 
including the divers there, want to be a Navy diver in Norfolk, Virginia, when it's 30 degrees out and you got to dive in Norfolk Harbor with 10 foot of suspended mud. Nobody. Sometimes in our Christian walks, we got to do Christian things, and it's not easy. This isn't a joy ride. This is a commitment to our Savior who died for us. It is as real as real as gets. And like those valiant men that went there and had the courage to do what is right when everything around was full, remember the, the Israelites departed out of the cities. The, the, they were in retreat. Think There was chaos. They said, this isn't right. We're doing something about it. God is in control. Let me back up. I would like to submit to you all for the, your consideration of this. All right? I'm sorry I run over. And this is the end of our study. This is the end of the message. I want you to think on these things. God is in control whether we admit it or not. It doesn't matter what you think. We have to choose who is our master. Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it your flesh? Is it alcohol? Is it sex? Is it business? Is it greed? Or is it Christ? There is a master. You have a master. I have a master. You have to decide. How can we serve the Lord when it's time to roll? Do we roll out our way? No. We need to roll out in his will and in his timing. His way and for his glory. Are we all in for Christ, right? You can always tell the people that are hesitant to do anything, like whether they're playing sports or weightlifting. Like when you're doing weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, you have to commit, okay? When you're doing a, a clean and jerk or something like that, there you have to grab that bar and move. If you hesitate, you're not going to complete the movement. Are you all in? Believer, are you all in? Have we come to a place in our life where we're like Hannah, right, in the beginning of 1 Samuel, where everything we have, want, or get is the Lord's? And that's our heart. We're for God. Do we face the battles of Christian life? Because there will be battles. If you choose this life, there is going to be battles. Well, there's battles anyway. But if you choose to, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that, there is going to be heartache, and there is going to be trouble, and there is going to be battles. And it's going to get ugly sometimes. But are you going to face those battles with the courage of David when he faced Goliath? Simply trusting in God to win the day while controlling the controllables, right? David trusted God to defeat Goliath, but David went and picked the rocks out of the stream to defeat, to have the tools he needed to defeat Goliath. Can we totally defeat sin that is in life with the pure violence of action that is needed to defeat sin? Violence of action is not letting... is. Surprise, violence of action. That is what wins battles. Violence of action is once you're going to commit violence, you do it all the way. With sin, when you have that sin in your life, we all have sin, okay? This is not me pointing at anybody else. Are you going to be like San, uh, uh, Saul with King Agag? You're just going to keep your little pet sin off to the side? Because that's all right. Christ will forgive me. Or are you going to go all out like Samuel did and destroy King Agog? Control the controllables. Do we encourage, how about this one, do we encourage our fellow believers when we can see that when they're getting blessed by God, things are going well for them? Are we going to encourage them? Or are we going to be like Saul? Where we see a young brother in Christ who's obviously the God is blessing him, and there's so much in his life ahead for him. Are we going to encourage that young brother in Christ, or are we going to say, huh, what about me? Are we going to like Saul, who deeply resented the blessing of God on David? Control the controllables. 
And you know what? I say that because if God is with us, who can be against us? Why should we continue in these lessons of the faith? Why should we not stumble and give up? Because we need to finish the race. Because it's honestly for blood-bought sinners like me and you, if you believe, it's our reasonable service. The other thing is I kind of like to finish things well, right? When, don't you? And you know, if, whether that's finishing is when I close my eyes for the last times or I'm caught up to heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, either way I'm good. But he's coming back and I'm going to see him. Are you going to see him? When he comes, right? I can't wait. I just, I should, I'm way over, and I got to turn and read this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Proverbs 4. I really, I, I prayed about even having this in here, and I, I was very convicted that I should, so bear with me. We're almost done. In Proverbs 4, verses 23. This is meant to encourage the, you keep on with the race you know, I've kind of mentioned working out a little bit I ran marathons a couple marathons and everybody starts strong at mile one and mile two and mile three at mile 20 everybody hurts everybody thinks about quitting that's for the older saints in the room keep going we need you we need to see what that life of, of Christ, with Christ, looks like. So, and the other thing, too, for you young believers, and believers not so young anymore. There, again, in our gym, there's, a, there's, I think, a little post that says, you can cry, you can puke, you can bleed, but you can't quit. Verse 23 of Proverbs 4, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead, and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left and remove your feet from evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to present your word, Lord. And I just pray that, first and foremost, Lord, if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they would come into a relationship with Christ. Just, Lord, I pray they wouldn't sleep tonight. Give them no rest until they come before the throne and recognize Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life. And those of us who know your son and trust in your son and have the faith, Lord, I just pray that we will continue on when things get hard, when things get good, no matter what, Lord, every day consistently growing in you for your honor and glory. And it's his name we pray. Amen.